Good morning. Uh, we are in the middle of a sermon series through the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. Uh, this morning we come to a passage that is notoriously difficult. So, in researching this passage, um, I went to my elder, my shepherd, Alan Pate, uh, who has taught this, this book not long ago in a Sunday morning Bible class. And so I said, okay, this is a particularly tough passage. This is a hard one. Okay, so when you were in class and you taught through this text, what did you do with the first part of chapter 11? With great pastoral wisdom, he looked at me and he said, I skipped it. <laughs> so, I appreciate your help. I appreciate that. Okay, but this is tough to get into it. I want to tell you a story. When I was about eight or nine years old, uh, I had the opportunity to go to church camp for the very first time. I was very excited to get to go to church camp, uh, but it turned out I didn't like church camp all that much as a little kid. Um, after all, who wants to sleep on a hard bunk and eat terrible food for a week, right? But one thing I loved about church camp is that I got to wear my baseball cap for a week straight, Okay? Uh, the only times I had to take off my baseball cap were when I was sleeping, uh, whenever I took a shower, um, and for one other activity that I had to take my cap off, but all of the girls at camp could keep their baseball caps on. What activity was that? During prayer, right. During prayer, all the little boys had to take their caps off, but all the girls could keep them on, which seems pretty weird if you think about it. Okay, it turns out that, comes, that tradition comes from our text this morning, a very difficult text, I don't mind saying. 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verses 2 through 16. Okay, and just to tip my hand a little bit here, I am pretty sure that Paul doesn't care about nine-year-olds with baseball caps. Okay, and if we reduce this text, if we reduce the vision that Paul lays out here, and we take it down and make this into a simple rule, I'm afraid we've missed the point. Okay, and yet part of what makes this text such a difficult text is we only have one side of the conversation. Right? Everybody in Corinth, when they got this letter from Paul, they knew exactly what Paul was talking about. They knew exactly what problems Paul was addressing, and yet we've only got one side of that, and so we're stuck trying to piece together exactly what Paul is addressing, and we're never sure if we've got it quite right. Another thing that makes this a, a difficult passage for us to interpret is that Paul uses several words in this text which have multiple meanings. Okay, and Paul does this because he's a very subtle writer, and he's intentionally using some play on words in this text, but sometimes it's hard for us to know exactly what he's talking about. Okay, for instance, one of the words that he uses repeatedly in this is the word for head. Okay, now, head can mean a lot of different things. Head can mean the, the organ that sits on top of your body. Uh, head can also mean an authority, right? Like the head of your department at work is someone who's your boss. Okay, head can also mean the source of something, right? And Paul intentionally uses a word here which regularly means source, like the head waters, right? Or the source of a river, something like that, right? The head of the river. Okay, and so, if this passage sounds odd and confusing to you as we read it, uh, just realize you are in very good company, right? This has been a confusing text for thousands of years. Uh, this one is tough, I'm not going to lie, and yet, even though I think this is a hard text, even though I think it is, is open to some, some problems, I think it has some great principles in it which help us better understand the vision that God has for his church. Right? I think this is an important text. So let's look at this. This is 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 2. He writes, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay, which right away we've already run into some difficulties because when he uses the words there for man and woman, it's the same as the words for husband and wife, which I think is more along the lines of what Paul is actually talking about. We'll get back to that. Okay, verse 4. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head which he said in the previous section, his head is Jesus, right? So covering his head dishonors, not his physical head, but dishonors Jesus. Okay, but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. I think he means dishonors her husband, okay, which we'll get back to. It is the same as having her head shaved, okay? In, in their world, it's very shameful for a woman to go around with her head completely shaved. So Paul's being provocative here, verse 6. Verse 6. 
For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well cut her hair all off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Okay, I want you to note that these last three verses, this is all about creation language. Paul is very intentionally drawing images from Genesis chapter 1 and 2 in order to make a point, which again we'll come back to. Just remember that this is all rooted in creation. Verse 10. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Okay, I'll explain the angels thing later because that just sounds really weird. What do angels have to do with anything? Verse 11. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. Okay, I think that last part, this is a corrective. Paul is not trying to teach there's this big hierarchy where it goes God, Christ, man, woman. Okay, I think Paul is saying this is all interdependent. Remember, it all comes from God. Verse 13, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, I don't know how we would be, right? We have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Okay, side note, if we haven't had enough side notes already. Um, but I love that this is the week that my wife decided to go get her hair cut off. <laughs> is the week that we were talking about how a woman's long hair is to her glory. Amen. That gets an amen, finally. Okay. All right, again, we've only got half of this conversation. This is so confusing to us 2,000 years later, but what in the world is Paul talking about? What is the problem that he feels he has to devote this much text to addressing? Okay, here's what I think. And again, this is up for a little bit of debate, but I think we're on fairly solid ground with this being the problem. Okay, what are the problems? All right, for women... In Paul's world, to go without your hair covered signaled to men your availability. Okay, I put that in quotes because you know what I'm talking about, right? I don't have to spell that out. Okay, so in the ancient world, women commonly wore either a shawl uh, or even a veil over their face when they were married to indicate that they were married. And it seems like what was going on in Corinth is some of the women started to say, well, you know what? We're free in Christ, Right? And that's a line we keep coming back to throughout this, this book of 1 Corinthians. Okay? And we misunderstand what it means when we are free in Christ. Okay? And so they were saying, well, we're free in Christ. We can let our hair down if we want to. Right? There are also accounts in the ancient world uh, of wealthy women in particular using their elaborate hairdos as a means of seducing men. Okay? Hair was recognized in their world as an object of lust. Uh, and so Corinthian women were using their unco uncovered heads uh, to advertise. Now, Paul has already addressed how freedom in Christ doesn't mean you can do whatever you want sexually. Uh, he talks earlier in the book about how the problem with the men primarily is they were still going to temples uh, and worshiping with temple prostitutes. Paul says just because you're free in Christ, that doesn't mean you're free to go sleep with a prostitute. That's not what freedom means. All right, and he's already talked about how freedom in Christ doesn't mean you can trample other people's freedoms. Okay, he's already said that the way of love cares more about how your actions affect others than it does how your actions affect yourselves. Okay, so for a woman to say, well, I don't have to cover my head and I don't care how it makes my husband feel uh, because I'm free in Christ, Paul says you are misusing your freedom. Freedom doesn't mean you can disrespect people that you're supposed to be respecting, and women, you're supposed to be respecting your husbands. Okay, I think that when Paul says that she's dishonoring her head and that her head is her husband, he's saying that by a woman in Corinth throwing off her veil that she's dishonoring her husband, and that's not okay. He says if that's the way that you view honor, you might as well go ahead and shave your head entirely and bring that kind of shame upon yourself. Now, 
Obviously, we don't live in that world. Uh, I don't see a single hat amongst any of our ladies this morning. Okay, and so the closest thing I could think of for an analogy in our culture is I've known uh, men before who after work, when they'd go out to have drinks with their buddies, they would leave their wedding ring in their pocket, right? Why would they do that? Because they want to flirt with the waitress, right? Um, And they want it to look like they're not married so that they can socialize and flirt as they want to. Right? I think Paul would look at that situation and say, if you're married and you're pretending that you're not married in order to flirt with people of the opposite sex, that's not freedom in Christ. You've completely misunderstood what it means to be in a marriage. Right? We're supposed to honor our spouse. Whenever we're married, we need to think about how our actions affect not only ourselves, but also our spouse. That makes sense? That all work? Okay. Uh, My email address is on the back of the bulletin if you need to email me about any of this, all right? Oh, we'll come back to that later. All right, number two. Uh, I think for men, the reason Paul says a man should not have long hair, okay, for a man to go out with your hair long or covered was the way that men in Paul's world went to go worship goddesses. Okay, we already talked about how Corinth was a city known for all of its temples to pagan gods and goddesses. Paul's already gotten on to them for going and worshiping at these heathen temples. And it turns out, if you read some of the ancient literature, uh, when men in their world would go to worship goddesses, the way they would do that is by becoming as feminine as possible. Okay, Uh, Men would grow their hair out long, they would wear jewelry, they would wear women's clothing, they would try to be as feminine as possible because obviously it's easier to connect with a goddess when you act like a woman. Uh, So, I found this as a a text. This is from Athanasius. He wrote this about men going to worship Hera, the the greatest goddess of all in the Roman pantheon. He says, when they did this, they wore bracelets on their arms, and when they celebrated the festival of Hera, they marched with their long hair carefully combed down over the breasts and shoulders. This custom is attested by the proverb, marching to the Heracum with braided hair. And they, when they had combed their locks, would go to the precinct of Hera, swathed in beautiful clothing, with snowy tunics that swept to the floor. Okay, that's just weird, right? That's the technical theological term for it, right? Okay, Paul says that men are dishonoring their head by having their heads covered and by using this play on words, I think Paul means when men are coming into church dressed like women, they're dishonoring Jesus. Okay? When you go to church, you don't do it in the same way that you go to worship pagan gods and goddesses. Okay? That's not who we are as members of the body of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, uh, I don't think that a lot of that was going on in Corinth I think the bigger issue amongst the men in Corinth is what Paul addressed earlier where they were going and worshiping with temple prostitutes. Okay, but Paul is using that in this same text showing both women and men need to think not just about themselves, but how do we honor other people with the way that we dress. Now, uh, I thought for a long while about something that might be equivalent to that in our culture, and I've got nothing. Okay, um... This really doesn't have a great parallel in our culture. The closest thing I could think of, and I think this illustrates some of the principles pretty well, uh, is that back when I was in college at Oklahoma Christian, um, I had a friend who was also a ministry major, and he had long flowing hair. I'm talking like Fabio length, you know, down halfway down his back, luscious, beautiful hair. Okay, it is. It was. I mean, he had he had a beautiful head of hair. He was very proud of his beautiful head of hair. And then one day, he shows up to school, and he's got a buzz cut. I mean, it was all completely gone. And he was a pretty good buddy. You might have asked him, he says, what in the world happened to your hair? Why, why, did, why did you cut it all off? And he says, you know what? I think there's absolutely nothing in the world wrong with me having long hair. But every time I would go to church, and I would get up and say prayers, or I would lead a communion talk, or I'd want to preach, or do any of the things, there were a bunch of people at church that that was really bothersome to. He said, if my hair is going to be a distraction to other people, then better for me to give it up than keep it, even though I think there's nothing wrong with it. I thought that showed a lot of maturity. But then he said, also, I'm looking at getting a job soon. I think this is going to hold me back, which, okay. (laughs) Either way, I think he probably made the right move. 
Okay, so what do we do with this, right? We don't live in their world. We live thousands of years later. What are we supposed to do with this? Uh, I think it would be wrong for any of us to dress in such a way that was intentionally offensive, right? If you're dressing in a way that is designed to be provocative to other people around you, that's not what we're about, right? Uh, a silly example of this might be, you know, I've preached a lot of funerals in my, my years in ministry, uh, and I would never show up to preach a funeral wearing shorts and a t-shirt, okay? Why not? Are shorts and a t-shirt sinful? No, nope. in fact, some of our deacons better hope not, right? I've seen a few of them, right? Nothing sinful about shorts and a t-shirt, but that would be very dishonoring uh, to show up at a funeral dressed like that, so I would never do it, right? Again, we don't need to think about ourselves. We don't need to be at the center of our own world. We need to think, how do our actions impact other people around us? How do we love other people around us? Even with something as simple and mundane as the way that we dress, how are we loving people around us? Okay, so here's where I'm at on this very strange text. Uh, I don't care what you do with your hair or your hat. I really don't. Uh, if you want to shave your head, if you want to grow it out, you want to put a hat on it, go for it. I really don't care unless it's an Alabama hat because that's just offensive. Okay? We can all agree on that, right? Okay, now, in our world, uh, there's no sexual or idolatrous signals that we send with our hair. So I don't think Paul would care that much about it for us either. Okay, what I do care greatly about, and you notice I didn't give you a one, two, three to put notes on on your bulletin, but if you're going to pay attention to one thing, if you're going to write one thing down this morning on notes, let it be this. And that is that in everything we do, we should care more about how it reflects on our spouse and on Jesus than we do about how it impacts our personal comforts or desires. Okay, if we're married and we're dressing in such a way as to try to advertise our availability, okay, that's a problem. Okay, obviously whether we're married or not, I think all of us need to care about decent issues of modesty and propriety. Uh, obviously that'll marry by, that will vary by culture. Right? I can't give any blanket rules for exactly what that's going to look like. Um, but I think all of us should be aware of how even the way we present ourselves doesn't reflect just on us, but reflects upon people around us and as Christians, we have to think about how do our actions reflect upon Jesus as well. Okay, when we go out into this world, we are a reflection of Jesus. For a lot of people, we're the only Bible that they'll ever read. Okay, so how we present ourselves matters. Fair enough? All right. Now, I want to pull the camera back just a little bit on this text. I want us to get a, a better look at the overall message of Paul in this section, because I think it's bigger than just this specific problem. Okay, first off, I want to say the this is the first of a section that Paul is doing, uh, the first part of a unit that will run all the way through chapter 14, talking about issues of worship. Okay, how do we approach worship? How do we participate in worship as the people of God? Right, Paul talks here uh, about public prayer and prophecy. He will go on to talk about communion. How do we approach the Lord's table? How do we approach using spiritual gifts in our worship services? And so on. Uh, in all of these things, he says we should be guided by the most excellent way, right? Which he'll hit on chapter 13 very hard, uh, which the guiding principle for how we approach everything in worship has to be love, right? It is always love. When we get the love piece right, uh, the rest of everything tends to fall into place, right? It's all about worship. Okay, so our passage this morning is one in which Paul uses creation language, and this isn't the only place he does it. We talked about this a lot when we talked about Paul in Romans. He'll do it in some of his other letters as well. But Paul uses creation language to talk about worship. Because to Paul, creation and worship are very intricately connected to each other. All right? So, here is the story that when we gather together to worship, we are telling Right? And we need to make sure that the way we act in worship fits with the story that we tell as disciples of Jesus. Okay, so here's the story that we tell. All right, God created the world in perfection. You go to the very beginning, uh, when God creates it, he says it is good. When God says it is good, he means it is perfect. Everything is great when God first creates the world. It doesn't stay that way for very long, though, because we read in chapter 3 of Genesis that sin broke creation. Okay, all of creation is now broken. Our relationship with God, 
Our relationship with each other is broken. We live in a fallen world. We know that. But because of Jesus, all of creation will one day be restored to perfection. Jesus is coming back. When he does, all things will be made new. No more violence, okay, no more sickness, no more death, because ultimately Jesus will have the last say. Okay? That's our story. All right, now, in the church, we celebrate that we are already a part of the restoration of all things. Okay, when we come together to worship, we are experiencing that foretaste of glory divine. Okay, our relationship with God is already restored. Our relationships with each other are supposed to already be restored. We are supposed to be reflecting in our church the unity that the world will one day know when every tongue confesses Jesus is Lord and every knee will bow before the throne. Right? The church is the vanguard of the restoration of all things. Okay, that's Paul's vision that he's laying out here. He gets it straight from Jesus. Okay, when we worship, this is the story we're supposed to be telling. So if all of this is true, then how dare we come to worship in ways that reflect the brokenness of creation instead of its restoration? So how wrong would it be for a church to meet with rich people on one side and poor people on the other side? Right? How wrong would it be for us to bring in food that's been sacrificed to an idol? Right? How wrong would it be for a church to divide along racial lines? Okay, how wrong would it be for churches to follow different human leaders instead of Christ? Okay, how wrong would it be for us to have a church where we couldn't even get along with each other? Okay, how dare we proclaim the reign of God on earth and yet live as if Jesus hadn't brought us peace at all. Okay, so when Paul talks about hair coverings, and he does it in the context of worship, he's saying even how we dress, right? If some women were letting their hair down and were announcing their sexual availability, okay, that communicates brokenness, not restoration, not wholeness. It violates the very nature of worship. It contradicts the story that we're telling. All right, so that brings me to the oddest verse in this whole thing, okay? Here in chapter 11, verse 10, where he says, It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels, right? What do angels have to do with any of this? All right, one of several places we could look to in Scripture, other places uh, to get this idea is Psalm 138. Another place we could go is Hebrews chapter 12, but I picked one verse out of Psalm 138. Where the psalmist writes this. He says, I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing your praise before who? Before the heavenly beings. Now I've got to fly. All right, some versions translate that gods. Uh, some do it angels. I think heavenly beings is probably best. Okay, but what the rabbis taught and what the early Christians believe, what we read about again at the end of the book of Hebrews, is that when God's people gather together to worship, it is bigger than just the bodies we see in this room. When we gather to worship, not only is God here with us, but the angels as part of his panel plea are all here with us as well. Okay, and again, this is really important to the theology of Hebrews at the very end of that book because he's saying, y'all are looking around and there's 20 of you sitting in the living room and you think, what does it matter? But if you only had eyes to see how the glorious divine council is here worshiping with you, that would change your entire perspective on worship. Okay? So, why does it matter for the sake of the angels that women worship with their head covered? Okay, if we are worshiping in ways that reflect brokenness instead of restoration, it's bigger than just us. It also affects the angels that are here worshiping with us. Okay? What we do here matters. When we gather together to worship, we are proclaiming to the world, we are proclaiming to each other, we are even proclaiming to the celestial hosts that Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay? And that matters.
All right, a smarter preacher would probably end here. Um, but y'all know me better than that, right? Um, so one final thought before we're done, um, and this is something that's longer than we can unpack right now, but I promise we will come back to it. Uh, this is a part of the text that is really the most controversial of all, and I almost um, skipped it, but I don't want to ever be accused of skipping parts of Scripture that make us uncomfortable. Right? I think it's important if we want to be a biblical people uh, to take the full counsel of God's Word, um, even the parts that might make us squirm a little bit. Okay, but here is my, my final point this morning, and again, we'll unpack it a little bit later. Okay, but when we worship, oh, I, that's the thing I just said, never mind, we'll skip that. All right, final thought. Okay, Paul assumes and approves in this text of women praying and prophesying for their brothers and sisters in worship. Okay, now, in a few weeks, we're going to get to chapter 14, where Paul says women should be silent in all the churches. And I firmly believe that whatever we do with that text, it can't contradict what we do here in chapter 11. Okay? In some way, those texts have to go together. Paul's not being inconsistent. Okay? So what are we going to do with that? All right, We'll talk about that more later. Again, my email address is on the back of the bulletin if you need to the email. Address, that's fine. Okay, but the assumption is when we come together as the body of Christ, we use our gifts for the edification of each other, that both men and women were part of this, and that's part of what it meant to be part of this restored creation. Fair enough? All right, we'll come back to that. Okay, again, I want to leave us with the thought, though, that what we do in worship matters. Okay, we are proclaiming restoration to a broken world by the power of Jesus, Right? And I pray this morning that wherever you are in your life, you're experiencing that restoration today. Uh, I pray that you have a relationship with Jesus that leads you to a place of wholeness in spite of the fact that we live in a very broken world. All right, at this time in our service, we are going to sing a few verses of an invitation song. During the singing of this song, I will be down front. One of our shepherds will be down front. Uh, this is a time where we as the church want to be here for you. We would love to pray with you or talk with you about anything that's going on in your life. And before we sing that song, I'd like to close us with a word of blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. Let's stand and sing.